So thank you very much for inviting me to um, give a talk here today. It's been a really interesting meeting. And uh, I must admit, I was really struggling as to whether or not my talk was going to be on message or not. So I think it's approximately so anyway. Um, and Tim, I'd really like if you'd get up and do a little dance about two minutes before I finish. OK. Uh, so um, I'm a public health doctor and epidemiologist, um, and uh, probably know less about genetics than most of you in the room. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, sorry, I can't get this working to go forward. Ah, OK, got it. OK, so three things that struck me about yesterday where um, Professor Carey saying we need to do the studies to provide the evidence base for clinical utility. Then uh, I think I'm paraphrasing here, so excuse me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think it was Dr. Aronson that said, if you're going to put things in bin two, you actually need to state clearly what you need to know to get it out of bin two. And the third thing that I think Elaine said was, um, that her priority was to have you know, better data to establish whether very rare variants are likely to be causal. So that, that, that's a huge span of activities, I think, that needs to be uh, considered. Now, um, the um, PhD Foundation in the UK, uh, I think Tim and um, Paul were involved in this, uh, recently produced this really comprehensive report uh, on the future with whole genome sequence uh, and what it means to the NHS in the UK. And one of the statements that they've made is that the NHS presents a wonderful opportunity to implement um, whole genome sequencing in a way that's evidence-based, systematic, and efficient. Um, so I think what I was going to try to sort of talk about today was how can NHS data really be used? What are the practicalities and some examples uh, about how such large-scale data might be usable for answering some questions to help to close the translation loop. And I wanted to use MODI, Maturity Onset Diabetes in the Young, which you'll all know is monogenic diabetes, as a sort of a working example of that. Um, so I'll just briefly mention something about electronic healthcare data available for research in Scotland, mention our bioresources and how we link them to data, and then talk a bit about MODI. It's very unresponsive. Um, so the key points uh, are that in Scotland, we've had a unique healthcare identifier for quite some time now available on all healthcare records. So it follows the patient around with every healthcare encounter that they have, okay, and through to death records. Um, and this unique identifier permits linkage between many different available data sets. Um, so, for example, we can link together all hospital admission records going back to 1981. Um, we can link to maternal and child health care records. Uh, we can link to psychiatric records. Um, and in some circumstances, we can link to primary care data, though the expert on primary care data is here in the room, so we can pick his brain after. It's John Parkinson, who manages GPRD. Um, Importantly, through a Wellcome Trust funded initiative, the Scottish Health Informatics Programme, uh, a bunch of us led by Professor Andrew Morris, who works in Dundee, where I'm also based, uh, have been working through a wide range of issues, uh, including, importantly, some of the governance issues and data safe haven issues for how you actually collate and use those kinds of data. To mention one or two bioresources that we have, because Rex said at the beginning, you know, we need to really ask ourselves, do we have enough actual established bioresources uh, and available data sets with good depth of clinical annotation? So here's one example. Generation Scotland is a triumvirate, really, of three studies, but probably the most interesting one is this one here, the Scottish Family Health Study, which is now completed collection. It has altogether about 24,000 patients in this study. Um, uh, they're actually sampled from the general population. They have extensive and deep phenotyping done. Um, they, it's a pedigree-based structure, so uh, it comprises about 7,000 families. Um, and and importantly, we can link all of the data to all of these other routine healthcare data sets that I mentioned. So it's an enormously valuable resource for research, and it's open uh, for people to apply to use it. Um, 
Uh, sorry, I'll just go back. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. Can I go back? Right click, that's what I'm doing. But it's not working. OK. OK. So um, uh, there's, a, as I say, a depth of phenotypes on here. I won't go through them all. Um, uh, so there are some study specific instruments that are used um, in, in, in uh, Generation Scotland. Now I'm going to turn to diabetes data. Uh, in Scotland, we have about 250,000 people with diabetes. Uh, about 25,000 of them have type 1. Um, we have an electronic health care record that is uh, used throughout the country. Um, it's used by most hospitals as its primary EHR, but even where it's not, there is a feed in to SkyDC, as we call it, from the EHR that that hospital is using. It also receives a nightly feed uh, of key items from every primary care physician in the country, bar three, um, on quite a lot of data, including issued prescriptions. So that's pretty much what I spend quite a lot of my time on, is studies that are built around this data set. And we can link this data, the data in this data set to, as I say, all of these other uh, uh, records uh, systems here, database systems here. And importantly, we have built various bioresources. So the uh, Wellcome Trust funded uh, case control bioresource, for example, uh, linked to these data in Tayside has been pivotal in a lot of the replication studies for the major uh, uh, finds of, uh, disease, of, of genes for type 2 diabetes in the last few years. The type 1 bioresource is something I'm building at the minute. We started collecting in February, and we've biobanked almost 3,000 patients so far. And our focus with this uh, ultimately we want to get to 10,000 is really very much around diabetic complications. Ah. Sorry, I, I'm just not getting on with this at all. Um, so uh, this is what happens when t Tim tells you to hurry up. Um, okay, so we have these bioresources, but you could just as easily substitute the brave new world of what if you have uh, next generation sequence data on all these patients, and even what if patients get it themselves and want to upload it and append it to their clinical record, because um, we do have a patient-facing aspect of the data set. Um, uh, so uh, we might want to think about that. So that's a bit about resources, and oh god, two minutes. Okay. So, Modi. Most of you know about Modi. 80% uh, of Modi is uh, it's monogenic diabetes, but it's usually clinically misdiagnosed as either type 1 or type 2. Uh, we've known about Modi and we've known about the genes that underpin it for many, many, many years, right? This work uh, by Andrew Hattersley's group, who's the world's leading expert on Modi, um, has shown that we currently diagnose less than 20% of all Modi. Okay, I don't know what the figures are in the US or how anybody's looked. I know that EGAP, have, you have it on your list, but you haven't done your review yet uh, uh, of it. Um, uh, so why? So it's a perfect example of an actionable but unactioned variant. And maybe we need to take stock before we worry about all the stuff we're going to learn tomorrow about how lousy we are at implementing what we know today. Um, and so uh, there's a whole bunch of issues here in relation to this, uh, which I won't go through. But the question is, how do we do studies that actually solve some of those issues? Now, first thing is, there hasn't been a cost-benefit analysis, OK? But the different data elements that would be needed for that are, still need to be generated. So at the minute, um, some of the studies we're doing are using our bioresource linked to our national data set, and in conjunction with Andrew Hattersley, uh, doing a study called the United Study, where we're evaluating certain algorithms for prioritizing who should get sequenced, OK? Um, so that's an important thing. And that's part of the actionability as distinct from the clinical utility space. 
Okay, so one of the real issues here is to bring down costs, to improve that cost-benefit ratio. The question is, should you stratify first with biomarkers and family history and clinical features from the record? If so, how? Which ones are best? Which ones yield more? Which ones are most cost-effective? And interestingly, this is one area where you might want to think about other biomarkers in your biobank being really useful for telling you something about who needs to be sequenced. So uh, fascinating aside here is that a GWAS of the plasma glycome recently revealed HNF1 alpha, one of the main genes for Modi, to be um, a, a master regulator of fucosylation. Uh, opening a whole field of using end glycan branching assays as a diagnostic test. Um, so that's one example. Uh, another example where I mentioned randomized trials is um, exactly in this field of clinical decision support. So one of the things we're trying to design at the minute, which we can do, uh, uh, it's not exactly randomized, but what we can do is we can implement in different parts of the country a clinical decision support tool to prompt the potential screening for Modi, and we can compare then how well that's achieving an increased yield of cases in comparison to the status quo. So that's something we're trying to design at the minute. Um, uh, I've mentioned about the uh, studies on uh, looking at the different algorithms for how you might approach something. Um, and then I think an interesting thing to go back to Elaine's question about how to infer causality, we might want to consider what the future will look like if you've got lots and lots and lots of sequence data that you just happen to have on people. Okay, and you have lots of phenotypic information, how we best exploit that. And at the minute, I think this is an idea that I cooked up with my husband when I was talking to him about coming here this week, because he's been doing some work on um, basically detecting, um, using GWAS data, increased uh, regions of uh, IBD sharing. So if you have lots of GWAS data uh, in your population, You've already got some Modi cases that have been sequenced. You could look at the IBD sharing and actually say, hang on, some of these patients who appear to be type 1 are actually have excess sharing uh, with some of my known Modi cases. Is this a route to detection? So you could do a whole sweep of your population to, uh, to uh, evaluate people. Anyway, just a thought, but I think it's worth thinking through. Uh, summary and conclusions, we need to harness the power of EHRs linked to bioresources to complete the translation loop. We can do the clinical and validity and utility studies, but that needs money. Uh, and um, we can also think about the uh, more actionability questions, including uh, actually doing randomized comparisons of approaches to actionability. Um, but it needs demonstration projects and systematic effort, and I would say with uh, some careful consideration about the feedback of WGS data at the minute uh, in these situations. And finally, any effects of reporting back need to be formally evaluated so as to feed back into clinical utility. I'll stop there. Sorry about the slide dancing. Uh, the, I'm, I'm interested in the consent that you operate on. Is all the data anonymized, or is there? Do you have access to uh, identifiable data, and what consent were these uh, collected under? Okay, so we have two different systems that operate. Okay, we have one system if you just want to do what I call dry data analysis, where you're linking records together and they're completely anonymized, de-identified, etc. For that, what we do is you, we have a system whereby we have a privacy guardian as well as ethics committees. So we have to get a privacy guardian approval from everybody. But also, increasingly now, what we've set out is a blueprint for a maximal secure way of utilizing those data. So even when they're de-identified, our new system is going to require passports for validated researchers. It's going to re require the data to reside within data safe havens and so forth. So that's that level. Then in terms of bioresources, they are all by definition individually consented. So the patient comes in and we consent them for collection into the bioresource, but we also consent them for retrospective and prospective linkage to their clinical record. 
Okay, and then a third form of consenting that we do uh, with patients is ad hoc as patients come into the clinic, we consent them also into a research register, which allows us to uh, provide them directly with information about studies we're trying to recruit from without necessarily having to go through the primary care physician again. 